We acknowledge the Yagara and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussions around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. One way of thinking about this is Harry Potter. You've got the shyness and the awkwardness in Hermione. You've got that sort of more negative thinking if you think about Ron Weasley. And Harry's a go-getter. He's a sensation seeker. And the fourth group is more the impulsive kids. And I think Voldemort or Tom Riddle is the most Mm. impulsive kid you can imagine. That's Professor Marie Thiessen, AC Director of the Matilda Centre. And this is Reframe of Mind. The podcast that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health with the guidance of good science, philosophy and learning from other people's lived experiences. We're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. Last time on Reframe of Mind, we learned that it is possible to change our beliefs and behaviours, but why does this seem so hard? We definitely put the reframe in Reframe of Mind last week, Andy. Finally Mm. got around to that point where we can try and change the thing that we think But it seems to be that something deeper is going on than a simple acknowledgement and reframe. And what if the challenge you're facing is less about how you respond to bad news at work and more like a chronic addiction, for example? You know, we promised that we weren't going to give you a toxic positivity laden set of examples to magically fix your life. And we really feel like this is a question that needs more investigation. Yeah, because, you know, if someone could say, look, I'm just going to stop believing I can stop snorting cocaine and just stop, we'd probably have far fewer cocaine addicts in the world, right? So what is a reframe? Well, put very simply, it's taking another perspective on an otherwise poor set of circumstances to make positive change. But could we also, at a simpler level, just be addicted to some of the things that we believe and do? Maybe there's something we can learn from people who overcome addictions to substances like alcohol, illicit drugs or even sugar to help us overcome ingrained patterns of behaviour. Professor Marie Thiessen AC is Director of the Matilda Centre, Director of the NHMRC, Centre of Research Excellence in Prevention and Early Intervention in Mental Illness and Substance Use, and an NHMRC Leadership Fellow at the University of Sydney. And we loved chatting to Marie. Mm -hmm. She's a former National Mental Health Commissioner, an Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences Fellow, a Fellow at the Australian Academy of Social Sciences, and is the Chair of Australia's Mental Health Think Tank. She was Announced as a companion of the Order of Australia in 2018 in the Honours List, awarded a Westpac Australian Financial Review 100 Women of Influence for Innovation and (laughs) awarded an Australian Museum Eureka Prize as Outstanding Mentor of Young Researchers. So do you think that we felt a little bit intimidated having the audacity (laughs) to approach such a well-accomplished scientist for our little old podcast? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, but she said yes. She said yes. So here oh we my are. God, Marie has made a major contribution to Australia's health and medical research effort in the field of mental health and substance mm. abuse. In particular, she's known nationally and internationally for her research on the comorbidity between mental health and substance use disorders. And the Matilda Centre, which she runs, is committed to improving the health and well-being of people affected by co-occurring substance abuse and mental disorders. It was established in 2018 and aims to generate innovative and workable solutions to address substance abuse and mental disorders, which are currently the leading global causes of burden and disease in young people. So there are some big questions here. And when Mm. you're fortunate enough to grab some time with someone like Marie Thiessen, you really want to make the most of it. We really felt that Marie had so much to say of such great value that we wanted to bring you the full interview from beginning to end. In which she talks not only about addictions, but in changing the way we think and do things. Marie, welcome and thank you for your time today. We really appreciate having you on board. Oh, absolute pleasure. We've got so much that we could talk about and explore today. You've got a real depth and breadth of knowledge around addiction and substance abuse and all of the things that are connected to that. And I don't know if I'm starting off gently here or opening up a can of worms from the start, but I want to start by exploring everyday addictions and how they can creep in through socially acceptable addictive substances. So I'm thinking here about alcohol, for example, even the habit of just slipping into the local cafe every day for a daily dose of caffeine. How inevitable is it that we're all going to get addicted to something at some point in our lives? It's a fascinating question and it's one that has really driven me to do research in this area over quite a lot of years and I wish I had a really simple answer for that because, (laughs) you know, 
if you knew beforehand that drinking alcohol, you might get into trouble with it, that you you knew that information beforehand, then, you know, maybe you'd be a bit more wary. It's not a simple answer. But that said, there are things that leave some people more vulnerable to having problems with substances like alcohol and drugs. So that's one of the really important things that we do in our research, try and work out what leads people to be more vulnerable to have problems with these alcohol and drugs. It really does seem that society is at some points really using a lot of peer pressure in some instances. I'm thinking, for example, if I go out to dinner with some friends and I choose not to have an alcoholic beverage, the questions really come around, oh, why aren't you drinking or why don't you just have a small one, that type of thing. So Mm. it's the sort of thing that we need to kind of start to look at as a society. Yeah. You know, problems with alcohol and drugs, they're health problems. And unfortunately, particularly around alcohol, we do have a strong culture in Australia of linking alcohol continuously with sport or linking having a good time as only being possible if you're drinking alcohol. Mm. And it's just not true. And then, of course, when people do run into problems with alcohol, there's a sense of shame and stigma associated with that and it's just devastating we see for people who have problems with alcohol it can take up to 18 years before they'll talk to anyone about those problems that can mean they can start to have problems when they're 18 or 19 and they really wait until their mid-30s before they say to a GP or to a friend hey I think I'm you know this is really interfering with my life and maybe I need to do something about this but that can take 18 years so the stigma you know there's a positive side about the fun and people do often drink because there's a fun aspect to it but there can also be the negative side. Louise and I were talking this Mm. morning as well about different contexts in which drinking occurs and this this 18 year period before somebody reaches out for some help is it that they've actually just realized that they have a problem or have known for some time that they've got a problem when does that consciousness around that problem creep in? creep in yeah we've asked people you know we've said to them oh gosh you've been having problems since you were 18 or 19 why was it that you only first reached out in your late 30s and we find two or three different reasons that people talk about one is that they actually didn't think that there was anything that anyone could do to help them Mm. and And that's a real shame because we do have incredibly effective ways of helping people who are having problems with alcohol. The other is that they just felt incredible shame that they should be able to deal with this themselves, that everyone else around them was drinking and not having problems. And of course, that's a bit of a catch because there's so much stigma. You don't know whether your friends are actually having problems or not. So it was that incredible stigma and shame around it. And lastly, this can really catch it, it's insidious it's it's not like one day you wake up and you're suddenly having a problem it's lots and lots of little things accumulating it's not turning up to work because you're drinking too much it's having a hangover because you're drinking too much it's feeling like you need to drink more in order to get the same effect it's realizing that you might unfortunately have been have a problem with the police that you've been caught a couple of times where you're over the limit and you know the first time is it because you've got a problem the second time maybe you have but it it's an accumulative thing that can catch people up back to the idea of um shame when it comes to getting help i suppose for anything like it applies so much not just even in uh, addiction like drug and alcohol but even just for mental health in general like actually being able to take that pressure off ourselves and ask for help I wonder if what would help people to understand is that it's not a case of when someone says oh just don't drink anymore just don't smoke anymore just don't it's not that easy like there's physiological things that are going on in the body that are propelling us forward to keep making those decisions aren't there? Yeah and we often have this sense that it's just that you don't have enough willpower that if you had enough willpower If you were strong enough, you pulled your socks up, then you'd solve the problems. And as you said, it just isn't that simple. It's still a case that you can find ways to help. And it's not that it's impossible, but it isn't a simple case of just pull your socks up. How do we destigmatize asking for help? It's a really important question. And 
I think actually having this conversation with you is an incredibly positive way to do that. The more we talk about it, Mm. um, I think also that we need to start early to start understanding both the positives and the negatives associated with drug and alcohol use from an early age. I think, you, you know, we talked a bit about the fact that drinking and drinking alcohol is so positively associated with sports and Australian going out and so when you're younger when you're 13 14 or 15 and you're just before you're about to start drinking the message that you can have is incredibly positive and I think it's much more important we give a realistic message and and we make sure we don't normalize particularly in adolescence drinking. I think the stuff with the 18 year data I mean that hits really close to home to me and my experience not with alcohol in as a form of self-medication but you know I'd say you know my entire life gone through periods of experiencing anxiety disorders and sometimes mood disorders and then when I look at the stats that one in nine Australians experience you know anxiety disorders or six percent of us experience mood disorders each year like depression or something like that I think it has taken me 18 years to stand up and ask for help. Yeah and the stigma the stigma issues around depression and anxiety you know Australia has done an amazing job at reducing that Mm. stigma for depression and anxiety and so we do now see that we've got increased numbers of people who are feeling confident or are not feeling as stigmatized to ask for help for depression and anxiety but we've still got a long way to go when it comes to asking for help (laughs) around you know alcohol and and cannabis and drug problems really a long way to go but you know I think you're right the fact that we have seen such amazing changes with depression and anxiety gives us some hope around Mm. our alcohol and drugs and even seeing them as health problems rather than just seeing them as either a lifestyle choice or a lack of willpower. One of those reasons that I now talk so openly about medication I can in the last what 18 years or so I would have said oh no I should be able to think my way out of a problem like that it's all in my head or that kind of similar feeling of weakness and shame like I shouldn't feel like that Mm. nobody else feels like that Mm. but now I'm very happy Mm -hmm. to talk with people openly in conversation about well you know sometimes the medication's okay because it helps you get that breathing room to work on things and to change that way that you feel so I, mm. I suppose to kind of bring that back around to to alcohol and, and um, the other things that we get addicted to yeah it's how do we encourage people to stand up and ask for help like to yeah 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 because it's not it's there's so much I, I mean I can only imagine what someone who has a problem with alcohol or drugs where it noticeably affects their life because you can kind of hide with anxiety. Yes, yeah, and it's a lot more difficult to hide with um, when, you, when you're having the consequences. Yeah. Of, yeah, exactly. In what you just said then, it was a really interesting because we do get caught up in the shoulds mm. and, and as you were talking then I was thinking, yeah, people feel like they should be able to get better or it shouldn't be like this. And part of the responding and treatment for alcohol use disorders and for drug use disorders is around helping us to see our way through those mind traps because, and I'm a big one for that as well, I'm always telling myself I should do this <laughs> or I shouldn't do that <laughs> and I have to reframe it as, well, that's the way it is or should doesn't help me no. <laughs> because it's should is so unhelpful. <laughs> I, I try to ban myself saying should, um, but they are real skills to learn. And just reflecting on that made me think about the should word in my own life, but they're real skills to learn about how you can get caught in those traps. And then it becomes a vicious cycle. Mm. And a real skill around therapy is breaking into those vicious cycles of thinking so that people can see a way through it and a way to act in a different way or a different way way of coping with life rather than I should be able to cope I didn't therefore I'm going to drink and it's so powerful so so powerful so yeah just listening then now how do we break down we have had the most amazing success at the moment in breaking down those stigma and those stigma issues by working with people by Mm. working with people who have experienced these problems and understanding where they're coming from that's the first part that we've we've really learned a lot and it's it's really being in the present of understanding what the barriers are for them and stigma can be broken down into both having self stigma so a real shame coming from yourself and your feeling like you should be able to do it better and it can also come externally so the 
uh, unfortunately, the judgment that happens for others. And so thinking about that self-stigma in particular, we've worked a lot with using digital storyboards and digital portals and websites to make it as easy as possible for people to get information and evidence-based and trusted information so then they can start to engage with what the issues are and making sure we have that as trusted, evidence-based and as non-stigmatizing both that personal stigma as well as that societal stigma as possible and that's been incredible to see the uptake you know even in areas where there's addiction to methamphetamine or where there's problems with methamphetamine we get hundreds of thousands of people logging in clicking in getting information and then using that actually that knowledge has really broken down the stigma that they felt to ask for help and the stigma that they felt for family members asking for help as well. I wonder as a part of all of that judgment and self-stigmatizing that's going on how important anonymity is in being able to reach out for help because I imagine with some of the complexities that go on with substance abuse there might also be a fear there that they'll get in trouble by the law for possessing the things that they're taking. Yes yes and that anonymity and that ability to reach out with that anonymity particularly in the first instance is incredibly important. Now I think that is where there is incredible power about making some of those first connections through mediums like digital mediums. So I just really encourage people there are evidence-based sources of information and it's reaching out to those. You know, our our websites uh, called Cracks in the Ice, for example, for methamphetamine. It's reaching out for those and um, going to those uh, trusted evidence-based resources because there is a lot of stigma. We also talk a lot about the impact on families and families really needing that sense of being a safe haven and, and just holding things together for people while the chaos of the storm of the uh, drug use happens. And so it's also for families to be able to reach out and to get that information in the first place instance in a way that's anonymous and non-judgmental. Do you think as humans we're predisposed to addictions? Wow, that's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> we're addicted to getting addictions? <laughs> well, you know, we do like, yeah, it's a big question. And as humans, are we predisposed to that? You know, we have thought about this a lot, particularly amongst adolescents. And we haven't thought about it as are you predisposed to getting an addiction but we've we've thought well what are some of the risk factors that might mean that you might be more likely mm. to have some challenges and I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole here. But <laughs> oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all the time but in the world. <laughs> I've got I think one of the like I'm a parent of teenagers and Um, some of the work that we've been doing is trying to understand, you know, how teenagers see the world. And um, we've been framing it in terms of four different personality or ways that teenagers see the world. One of them is being quite anxious and nervous. And we've talked about anxiety and depression being related to, you know, substance use before. But one way, and you sort of know those kids, they're shy and they're a bit reserved. I was one of those kids when I was younger, quite shy, quite reserved. There's a second group of kids who are more prone to seeing the world as a little bit in a negative way. Now, I tend to think about, one way of thinking about this is Harry Potter, Mm. figures in Harry Potter. So for me, you've got the shyness and the awkwardness in Hermione. You've got that sort of more negative thinking, more seeing the doom and gloom in the world, if you think about Ron Weasley. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, Ron's in the Harry Potter series, the third set in the triumvirate is Harry. And Harry's a go-getter. He's a sensation seeker. And that's the third group of ways of thinking about teenagers. And the fourth group is more the impulsive kids and I think Voldemort or Tom Riddle is the most Mm. impulsive kid you can imagine so when I talk to the parents of teenagers 
you know, they, this resonates with them and they go, gosh, you did 20 years of research to work this out. But yeah, you can really think about kids in terms of those, predominantly the kids who are sensation seeking like Harry, the kids that are impulsive like Voldemort, the kids who are warriors like Ron and the kids who are anxious like Hermione. So, you know, where am I going with this with alcohol and with drugs? Well, it's fascinating, but of those characteristics, we are able to pick up the kids who have those characteristics and then also predict later on in life which of those characteristics lead to which sorts of problems they might have with alcohol. And it's those impulsive and sensation-seeking kids that can have problems in terms of binge drinking with Mm. alcohol. And again, it gets down to they'll have hot thoughts, they'll have intense thoughts about their emotions. And one way of dealing with those intense thoughts is to drink alcohol. For the anxious kids and for the depressed kids, they can find themselves, if they've got those trays, running into problems with alcohol because they drink to cope. They drink to cope with the alcohol or they drink to cope with the feeling of negativity. So what does that mean for the research that we do? If we've been able to observe this and think about, they're not addictive personalities, but they're trays that lead people to be more vulnerable to have problems. So can you get in and intervene with those trays? Give kids other ways of coping and young people other ways of coping and if you do does that mean they're less likely to use alcohol as a solution when they turn 18 if you work with kids who are 13 you can identify these things can we give them some different skills and in doing that would that change their course or the trajectory so that's the type of research questions we've been asking and we've just finished a s- amazing seven-year follow-up of 2,000 young people where we went in and we did two two really simple, quick 90-minute sessions with them to help them to first identify where they fit. Are they sensation seekers? Are they more towards negative thinking? Are they more towards anxious? Are they more impulsive? And then giving them some skills. And we found at the end of seven years, you could actually change the trajectory of where they were. So it's so powerful. Adolescents are absolute learning machines. And the thing we need to do is work with them to work out ways to give them more positive ways of coping with the world than alcohol or drugs. And I just love this research because it can change the trajectory of life for people. Mm. It's amazing. I wonder, looking at the research that you're doing and what you've uncovered here with those trays, is it likely or possible, for example, to be able to use some of these insights to build healthy habits? Absolutely. Absolutely. And a powerful thing and a powerful driving force for young people is wanting to be like your peers. And we call this a social influence theory. It's the theory around the uh, the influence of your peers and the influence of what you consider to be normative behaviour. So if I can give you an example, if you ask your 13-year-olds how many of their friends drink, they'll tell you close to 60 or 70% of their friends drink. And it's nowhere near that many. It's much, much, much lower. It's like 5%. Hmm. So, but even challenging that belief can then influence, oh, well, to be like my peers is not to drink. To be like my peers, you know, to be like my peers, they're thinking they have to drink. But really, to be like their peers, what they do is not drink. So using that and presenting that information, particularly in a peer-led way, peer-to-peer, is incredibly powerful. And that can also work not just for alcohol, but healthy behaviours like exercise, um, healthy behaviours like increasing your sleep, We talk about them as the big six risk factors for poor health in adolescence. So alcohol, tobacco, sleep, sugar intake, physical activity and screen time. And they are big six risk factors for for poor health in adolescence. And yep, you can switch it around knowing this information to actually increase healthy behaviours, not just decrease. I'm really interested that you actually included sugar as a part of the big six there. It's something that we don't often think about as as far as addiction goes. Yeah, yeah. So the sugar and, you know, in terms of a risk factor for poor health and sugar intake is absolutely one of the big six. I turn 40 next month, Marie. Happy birthday to me. Yeah, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I think I'm identifying as a Hermione. Is it too late for me now if I don't have a nice, fresh uh, teenage um, brain with all of its extra neurons and I'm setting my routine pathways? Oh, my golly, never too late. 
never, never too late. <laughs> and, you know, it's not as easy as when you're 13 and 14 or 15, but we sort of know that, don't we? We know that with most things in life. It's a lot <laughs> easier to do it when you're 13, 14 and 15. Um, but it is absolutely never too late to turn it around and to create what we're talking about here is creating positive coping mechanisms mm. rather than relying on what can be short term. You know, it does make you feel better when you've had a drink. But the problem is that that quickly shifts from being a short-term positive to a long-term mm. not positive. One of the things I used to, uh, I mean, I, I hardly ever drink now, but I would say that, you know, in my early 20s, I was probably part of Australia's binge drinking culture um, problem. <laughs> yep. But at one point, I think the switch flipped and I realised that after a few drinks, like it feels good to have a few drinks at first and then once you kind of lose control of those inhibitions, I mean, you lose control. So you no longer have control also of the way you feel. So you can go really quickly from this is the best night of my life to crying in a gutter on the side of the road because you're suddenly really down and everything is horrible. And I started to think that part is not worth it. Like that feeling of no longer having the ability to talk yourself out of feeling like that because your senses are so impaired is no longer worth it. Yeah, yeah. And I think people tend to forget that alcohol, it is actually a depressant. Mm. It does depress your mood. So you do get that initial lack of inhibition. But yeah, absolutely. You then forget that alcohol is actually a depressant. So you you do have that sense of the chemical impact of having alcohol in your brain is really raising those emotions of feeling sad and and not feeling in control so should we give it up or should we replace it with something else i mean where is that line like where we say someone's got a problem with alcohol is it one glass a night is it a bottle a night yeah there's amazing work in australia in this area and if you're wanting to set your expectations of not having harm to your health from alcohol, then, you know, the guidelines are quite low in terms of how much alcohol you should be drinking. And we set the NH and MRC guidelines quite low for how little alcohol you should be drinking before you start to impact on your health. Um, I mean, one big area we've been working on is the area of drinking during pregnancy. And in the past, it, it was thought that even having just a glass of alcohol, and unfortunately, sometimes women were even encouraged to have it to calm mm. down during pregnancy. But recent research that we've done has shown that even small amounts of alcohol, even as low as three or four glasses of alcohol during a pregnancy, particularly early on in pregnancy, can result for young children when they're after they're born when they're turning nine or ten we've done the follow-up studies they can be more likely to have anxiety and depression and have health problems if their mother drank during pregnancy mm. and it can alter the way that our brain develops to leave us more vulnerable to having problems later on so it's quite low and I think it's probably the most important thing is resetting the expectations. The expectation, I think, in Australia is much higher levels of alcohol. It's okay to drink. Mm. But um, I think what's probably the most important thing we need to do is to reset those expectations so that we have a culture where we've got less drinking and even no drinking um, is acceptable. Now that I rarely drink, I don't care anymore. Marie though like it would have mattered to 20 year old me but yeah 39 year old me just I don't I don't care I don't need I don't need it it doesn't help me feel any better I feel worse the next day yeah 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 and I'm not sure that's always the case that you have to w wait till you're 40 to get <laughs> I that I think there are some 20 year olds who feel that way too would have been better uh, instead of crying in the gutter outside a Canberra nightclub at like 19 that would have been a better choice to make then <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really hard thing though, isn't it, when it's so much part of our culture. Mm. And it's a very hard thing to say to young people that, you know, no more than 10 a week and 
four on any day is what we're talking about if you don't want to have harms from alcohol. It almost kind of seems like these habits are slipping in through the back door. I mean, I remember myself when I was in my 20s going out with some work chums and we had somebody in our group that didn't drink and the questions were all around, oh, come on, mum won't hurt you, that kind of thing. And she had, up to that point of her life, never even thought about drinking alcohol because it was a part of her culture, not to think about alcohol that way. I wonder if we maybe need to start swinging around with with younger people and teaching them things like self-esteem and how to say no and how to actually strengthen themselves against those social norms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You touched on two things there that I thought might be like interesting to talk about Mm -hmm. as we were in that question. One was teaching young people about how to say no in an assertive way and we've certainly been doing that through blending those methods with the amazing ancient art of cartoons and storyboards. So Mm. we've created cartoons and storyboards, which are are like love stories between different characters that we've worked with young people to develop. And it's Michael meets Jane or Michael meets Claire or Claire meets Claire. And in that, their relationship and friendships build. And we talk about how people can have incredibly positive relationships and friendships without the use of alcohol or how alcohol can get in the way of kids playing sport or how you can actually have fun or drink drug refusal skills how do you refuse you know that if you've got someone who's saying to you have a glass how do you make sure you've always got something in your glass so that there's no point them saying to you oh you haven't got anything in your glass let me get you an alcohol <laughs> you, you, I've learned very already quickly got to put my hand over the glass you got your yeah. hand over the top <laughs> all of those incredible skills that's it so um, firm no or, <laughs> yep or a firm no absolutely but it takes skill to say a firm no in that sort oh, of oh no the hand over the glass is my firm no I love it <laughs> I'm very passive I love it <laughs> I love it. So, but they are skills, aren't they, that we don't get taught. Yeah, so for sure. So I'm all for, how do we do that? How do we teach those skills? As as parents, we need to teach them. Parents are incredible influences of young people. It's not just their peers. How do peer-to-peer we teach kids to do that? That's your right to say no. I love the fact that we've, you know, the click clack um, wearing your seatbelts campaign. That was a big public health campaign in Australia. And they first started by teaching the parents to say, you know, you should be putting the seatbelts on your kids. And that worked to a certain extent. But what was the most powerful was telling the kids it was their human right to have their seatbelt. So in the backs of the cards, the kids were saying to their parents, it's my human right for you to put my seatbelt on, do it. And giving them the power to do it (laughs) changed our compliance with seatbelt wearing it was incredible so I'm for giving the kids the skills definitely and the second bit was women we've sort of touched on this a little bit I don't know about you guys I'm over 50 so I remember going down happy birthday thank you (laughs) (laughs) I, I remember going to Tasmania in the early 80s and going into a bar to have a beverage after being on a long walk and being ushered into the ladies lounge (laughs) <laughs> so I was not allowed to have a drink in the lounge at the front of the pub because there was a ladies' lounge. And that relationship between women and alcohol in our country and around the world has changed dramatically because if I went down there today, I wouldn't be ushered over into a separate spot. Drinking wouldn't have been seen as taboo and stigma for a woman. If I go down there today, I can drink and I'll I'll be in the front bar. I don't have to go into the back where I'm stigmatised. So drinking for women has actually been a lot more, it's now a lot more normative. And because of that, we're actually seeing increasing rates of problems for alcohol in women. And it's really sad. So I'm, trust me, I am 100% for women's rights and I'm 100% for equality. But we've also, unfortunately for women, now seeing similar rates of problems for young women particularly around the harms from alcohol it almost sounds like an exclusive club doesn't it the ladies lounge ladies lounge but it wasn't it was, it was an exclusive <laughs> club it was an exclusive club you weren't allowed to be yeah. seen drinking at the front of the I, i'm hotel. fascinated by this so you know now we can talk about it because ladies lounges don't really exist anymore but were the alcoholic beverages different to the men's area were they softer? Yeah, they weren't softer. They were. <laughs> they were <laughs> not in this. <laughs> not in this pub in Tasmania. They weren't softer. <laughs> 
no. It's a good question, but no, they're not soft. Well, I'm just I'm yeah. picturing ladies with shandies and pims compared to. I think to, there was a lot of know? shandies. I think there were a lot of shandies, but the but the drinks on offer were certainly at this point in time in the 80s they weren't soft. But there were you a lot were of shandies. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know that is also a challenge about what we offer. You know, alcohol has changed in the types of alcoholic drinks Mm. that we have available to us. So when I was growing up, it was the bitterness of wine. It was the bitterness of beer. And that's actually incredibly protective when you've got a young palate. You don't Mm. like... It's hard to drink alcohol that's wine or beer because it is quite bitter. The drinks that are available now are much more sweet. We're getting back to the mix of sugar Mm. and alcohol and the complexity of having those two things together. But the drinks that are available now are much sweeter so they actually are much more palatable to young palates hey there just wanted to take a little breather from today's episode and say thank you so much for listening to us make sure you never miss an episode by hitting the follow button on your podcast app now and while you're there we'd love you to leave us a review it really does help to boost us so we can reach even more people and check out our patreon page to see how you can access even more content at patreon.com forward slash reframe of mind and remember to tell everyone you know about us the more people we get talking about mental health the more supported we'll all be do you think that peer-to-peer is kind of the antidote to peer pressure? In our research, I have been amazed at the power of peer-to-peer. It has to be mixed with the right evidence and the right information. So when we talk about peer-to-peer, we've been doing that through, as I said before, cartoons and storyboards, because it's a big responsibility on young people to deliver peer-to-peer. I mean, they're living it themselves, right? They're in the middle of it. Mm. So we've used the medium of cartoons because that can empower young people. Our cartoons are all cartoons of young people. We don't have older people in them, but it allows young people to say the things that and teach each other the things that they want to teach each other without needing to feel like they're in a classroom and they could say, well, you know, oh, well, I did it, so therefore you know, it's okay for you to do it. It's quite hard to do peer-to-peer, face-to-face, but we've used the medium of cartoons incredibly powerfully to do this. Can we transfer those skills, um, like those peer-to-peer skills as an adult to make a difference in our circle of influence to help people kind of have happier, healthier mental outcomes so they don't need to rely so much on self-medication? Yeah, and again, having positive ways of having fun that are not just associated with alcohol is incredibly powerful in creating the environment where people can interact with each other. It's not having so much alcohol always at parties, not having them always focused around alcohol, having events that don't always have to have alcohol at the centre of them. In terms of the peer-to-peer support, giving each other support in a positive way rather than, oh, everyone should be drinking, to, you know, it's fantastic that you made the healthy choice not to drink at the party. Whenever do we say that? (laughs) And really, why don't we? Why don't we say to people, it was fantastic you made that positive choice in your life, you know, not to drink or, yeah, it would be an amazing day that we got to that position in Australia. I think it's going to take some time. How about it, a, a workplace kind of context, you know, like that kind of come along to this event that we've got tonight. It's optional, but it's mandatory. And when you get there, there's a drink and you can not drink, but then you're not a team player. How do we kind of tackle that workplace culture that goes on around this kind of enforced drinking socialism? Yeah, again, I'd like to think that, you know, eventually we can get to the sophisticated space where we can actually have work events where we don't have to have alcohol uh, associated with them. But, you know, that's a bit of a way off. It's both, again, individuals, so having those skills and testing it yourself. Like, can I go to the party, not drink and still have fun? And that's a great behavioural experiment that you can run with yourself. Maybe you don't have to do it every party, but you try it for one or two parties and test that, do that bit of a behavioural experiment of what we call behavioural experiment, which is go to the party, see what your behaviour is like without the alcohol. You might enjoy it. I think, you know, we were just talking about that. Mm. Sometimes it actually can be more fun to Mm. do that. And then it's also being around peers and having the conversations with them that maybe this is what you're going to choose to do and then gathering strength from you'll be surprised how many other peers will also be thinking that that's something that they might like to try we have an experiment and see whether we can actually have fun without drinking 
I do remember doing some experiments earlier in my life around this exact same thing. And I kind of found that over time, the people that I hung around with changed because being the only sober one in the room isn't always a heap of fun. And it gets a bit boring. I think sometimes from my own experience, I would drink because it was a way of joining in with the entertainment rather than actually taking that move and making myself that separate person in that social environment. Yeah, yeah. It can change. It can change the people who you're with. And that's such an interesting observation because I think it probably creates you a richer and more complex group of friends who like to do different things. And that's certainly been my personal experience. And it's been the feedback that we get from people who go through our programs and our treatment programs that changing this has actually meant that they've got a more rich and more interesting lifestyle. People who find different ways of having fun. I think one of the things I keep hearing you say comes out of this is like, as you look at your relationship with uh, drugs and alcohol and you work towards building a healthier relationship you kind of set these boundaries up for yourself of what's acceptable to you and it takes that strength to say I suppose no to peer pressure and I'm wondering specifically what skills will help with that but also how they can be transferable to other things because that's a case of stepping into your own personal power in regards to your relationship with drugs but you could do that in relationship to toxic friendships or anything that's really impacting your emotional well-being. Yeah there's a lot to be said for the skills that are, as you said, these are skills that can flow across, not just around relationships with drug and alcohol, but they are phenomenal life skills to have. And I think I said earlier, I even practice making sure I don't say should. Yeah. And that's Shouldn't not, say should. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> banned. <laughs> it's completely banned. And, and I use that in all all sorts of aspects of my life. So I 100% agree. These are amazing skills that you can have and that you can transfer across so many different areas. Are there any other specific ones that come to your mind that we can kind of adopt right now? The thinking traps of getting into the spiral of feeling anxious, drinking and then getting more anxious but the only way to cope with it is so the thinking traps and the spirals and observing them there's some great skills around just even if you think you're starting to have a few problems with your alcohol and use then using a diary to just write down when you're drinking because your brain can play tricks on you and you can think you're not drinking as much as you actually are so just even the simple method of actually writing down how much you're drinking can give you some feedback should is an incredibly powerful one Mm. to work with and just challenging that normative stuff you know everyone's doing it maybe it isn't everyone that's an incredibly powerful one too that sounded like homework to us didn't it andy sure did so we asked marie if she'd join us again a few weeks later and continue the conversation and she graciously obliged the thing that we took on board from last time that you said and we've you know it's been three weeks or so in between our last chat that we've actively done is we're trying to stop saying should ah fantastic It's surprising how many times I know I've caught myself doing it. Now that you've pointed it out, that it's a thing that people say. Yes. Yeah, it's, oh, uh, it's hard. It's quite catchy, isn't it? It is quite hard. It's quite catchy. But I also find it incredibly empowering to recognise it in myself and to catch myself and now get quite a sense of relief when I recognise that I'm saying should. Unlike, um, of course, now I'm going to say um all the time. (laughs) You're going to be so conscious of it after this chat. (laughs) Unlike, um, that little word should is so powerful because it's so laden in guilt and expectations. So I think really it's not underestimating the power that one word can have in our lives and the way that we can change the way we interact with the world by reflecting on that and by just making a small change, what seems like a small change, but I think you've both picked up where it can snowball into being a really large positive change. I'm so happy to hear that works for you. The way it works yeah, for me. Yeah, noticed it in things like, uh, particularly, I suppose, in forecasting stuff, you know, oh, I should have this done or I should have this figured out by now. And who's really putting these arbitrary rules on things? Because it's just adding anxiety to the pile that didn't need to be added. Yeah, and I should feel this way or I should feel mm. that way. 
And again, like you said, it's adding the anxiety onto that pile and you really don't need to add any more anxiety onto that pile. And expectations on ourselves, like we are in control. We can actually set the rules and we can set the timeline. And to allow other people to do that can just really increase that anxiety. What are you replacing your shoulds with when you hear them? Oh, I try and set them into a much more realistic It depends on what the area is that I'm saying should in. A big one for me is, you know, I should finish my work a lot faster than I am finishing it. And the reality is that I'm finishing in the time that I am finishing it. There are factors that are associated with that. I may like to do it um, slightly faster or in a different way. And I can then, by chucking away should think about well what are the things that stop me from doing it in the way that I wanted to do it. Another strategy I use is not I should finish the work but what are some of the positive things about finishing earlier? Mm. What are some of the less positive things about finishing earlier and how can I get to those? So chucking away should allows me to pull the issue apart a little bit more and to reflect that okay, I might be doing it slower, but I'm still getting it done. Mm. So it allows the positive in. One of the subjects we were going to head into last time uh, was kind of a pros and cons of when we use substitutes for, I feel like I'm flipping completely from should here, but but for our (laughs) addictive behaviour as opposed to kind of investigating the cause. Like we were thinking, you know, some people might smoke, they might try and replace cigarettes with lollies, that kind of a thing. Whether this is a good thing to do or whether it's just, another problem we've always got the balancing going on in our heads haven't we Mm. and i think what you're talking about there is thinking through the levels of harm that our behaviors the things that are good or the things that are not so good about our behavior and where we land with those i think you're just then talking about replacing say for example alcohol with in sugary drinks or with lollies there's going to be harms associated both of those things it's working out what the better of that balance is so the better of two not quite two evils but the better of two options and perhaps it's getting that balance right that's a really challenging thing for people and there are options where you can go for the healthy option but maybe Mm. you don't have to do that every single time maybe you don't have to go to the unhealthy option every single time but unless you think about what your options are you won't have the choice to go for one or the other with the choices in reframing the way that we're thinking about it it's more about trying to give us something healthier to look forward to in general whether it be you know the lollies over the cigarettes or whether it be something else we're replacing for should for example yeah and part of that balance of balancing out whether you make one choice or another is tied up in short term and long term so the lolly can be really gratifying in the short term but we know we're going to be putting on weight or we're going to be increasing the risk of having tooth decay or increasing the risk of longer term heart disease we do often think about what's right up in front of us and then discount what the consequences could be longer term. So one of the things is actually writing it down and acknowledging that there are short term and that there are longer term consequences to what we do. We are incredibly clever as humans at discounting those longer term. It's like we're sort of inbuilt bravery machines. We look at the upfront and we don't think about the longer term and sometimes the more serious harms. And our brains are wired for that, so it's a challenge to make sure that we identify those and take those into consideration when we're making our choices. It's almost like it's too easy to fall into the trap of there's always tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. Is this the long-term yeah. thinking that you're thinking about? Yeah, that type of long-term thinking. That's ex- that's a great example. you got the chocolate block there. I'll put it off. I'll have it today, but I'll put off the change to tomorrow. I think that comes back to where it's a good idea of thinking about what are the good things about doing that? You're going to get the initial gratification, but it may be not some of the good things about doing that. Well, then tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow you'll have to do, if it's eating that chocolate bar, the accumulation of that sugar will end, end up, you'll have to do a lot of exercise in order to counter that. So it's being really explicit about the decision isn't just about 
what's happening to you right now. The decision is also about what's going to happen next week when every day you eat that chocolate bar. It reminds me of that, is it the marshmallow experiment where they put the marshmallows in front of the kids in a room and said you can either have one now or you can have five if you wait 15 minutes and no one <laughs> and no one could wait 15 minutes, I think. Um, That's so true. And, and kids, kids <laughs> are big. really good. Kids, me are, too. kids are hardwired to get those marshmallows early. <laughs> <laughs> and that kids, you know, the part of their brain that should kick in and allow them to do all this decisional work, the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, isn't well developed. So it absolutely, they're, they're really wired for taking risks. And you actually want them to. You want them to experience lots of things in life. That's why kids particularly have trouble with that marshmallow experience. <laughs> Adults, we got a bit more brain development. We should be able to kick into gear that decision part of our brain. If we intellectually know that we're better off waiting for 15 marshmallows later instead of one marshmallow now, or if we're better off making a, a healthier choice because alcohol drugs are not doing good stuff for us in the long term... Um, but we emotionally go for the one marshmallow or the booze, how do we kind of switch that thinking? Like, is there steps that we can take that actually help us make those long-term goals something that we can feel like we're achieving now? It's emotionally and it's also through habit. So we are also excellent at picking up cues and habit and the things that we would normally do. So part of the way of dealing with this is creating some new habits. And so the habit might be that you have two or three or four, you know, glasses of wine, even two glasses of wine in the evening. Maybe you have a glass of wine and a glass of water. You get into the habit of always having a glass of water in between having the glass of wine. So part of it is unlearning and then learning new healthier habits so that they become and practicing them so they become really second nature. Having a break in and allowing yourself to have a break from alcohol particularly over you know setting a time but having that break allows you to experience how you feel without actually having it so again breaking that habit and breaking that you know expectation so it's very much uh, thinking through ways to both allow you to change that behavior but also to allow you to change the way that you think about things and to challenge some of those thoughts that you might think the only way that you can have fun is by drinking or the only way that you can have fun or interact at a party is by drinking. Mm. It's a really interesting experiment to go to a party and test that out. Can you actually have fun at a party without drinking? Now, I'm making this sound like it's super easy and it isn't and it takes as much practice as it takes, as we talked about earlier, to change your thinking and change the way mm. that you talk about things. That's a really simple example of should. To change behaviour takes as much practice and is, and is effortful like it is with the should example. How long does it take to change a habit? That's a really good question. And the reason I say it's a really good question is because it can take a minute to change that sort of first instant actually change the behavior but it can also take a lifetime so exercise is a really really good example you can think to yourself okay I'm going to get up I'm going to exercise and you can do that and often people can do that for the first three or four or even seven days and then something happens and they don't do it on that seventh day and they can then think well maybe I can't keep doing this and doubts can come in and I should be able to do it all the time there's that should word again mm. and because they didn't do it on that one day they think it's all lost but what about reframing that as well you actually did it for seven days that is fantastic fantastic so if you did it for seven maybe you can do it for another seven so not letting that little glitch in the change in behavior make you feel like that you can't change your behavior and you know we're really um, wired to have those doubts and one of the big challenges is taking that information that you got and challenging that the information is so powerful the information that you did it for seven days remembering that and using that as your strength in changing the behavior going forward do you think we need to show ourselves more empathy and forgiveness for um not changing things as fast as we think we should do them yeah definitely and and holding on to the positives holding on to what you can do and amplifying what you can do i've got a little bit of a saying 
I try and throw away my failures and hold on to my successes. And I acknowledge the failures. I try and learn from them. But after I've learned from them, I'm going to throw them away because I really want to focus on where the successes are. And it's the same in changing any behavior, whether it's eating those chocolate bars every day or whether it's changing your behavior so you can get up and exercise. And the habit is what is really cool. It can lead us down the pathway of things that are not helpful for us, but habit can also lead us down the pathway of things that are great for us. You hear stories of people, um, they say, I went cold turkey on something. I was able to give it up overnight and I never thought about it again. But I'm wondering if you think it really exists or if cold turkey is really just that kind of final manifestation of a whole series of other decisions that we've made along the way that maybe weren't so conscious. Yeah, it's a really interesting question and it's a very interesting issue to think through because, you know, some people can do that. They can say, tomorrow I'm never eating a chocolate bar ever again and it happens, they don't. You know, we do have in our research knowledge of people who have decided tomorrow I'm not smoking and they stop smoking but it's still more the exception than the rule and it's still for most people it will take effort and it will take time to change those behaviors we were chatting to a, a successful ceo yesterday and he was asked that when it comes to building the company and striving for his goals he doesn't actually make failure an option is that feasible so he's coming from a ceo perspective so i suppose it depends on your expectations if the question is is it possible to not have failures that failure isn't an option i come both from a research perspective and i come at this also from human behavior and addiction and for me Taking that context, we have to learn from failure in research. And we also, in a sense, in addiction, it's learning from failure where we've failed or haven't been able to change the behavior that we want to change. It's a different thing to say failure isn't acceptable. I'm not even going to allow failure to, I'll learn from that failure, but then I'll throw it away because it's not going to define how I will interact with the world in the future. It won't define for me as a researcher whether I'll try something new again because research is about trying taking a bit of risk trying things that are new if I fail once it's not going to stop me from trying again if I fail once with changing my behavior it's not going to stop me from trying again but I think that's a risk with saying that failure isn't an option because it doesn't allow you to learn from it and it also doesn't allow you to move on if it's going to happen my view is in life failure will happen I wonder if that's a risk sometimes of us falling into a trap of toxic positivity where somebody will say something that for them works. So this person said, I take fat off the table because that's his approach into making sure he bounces back and making sure he doesn't let any setbacks set him back or affect him that he's going to give up. So do we really need to start looking more into what we're saying and how we say it and how that might be supporting us or otherwise? I really love that term, toxic positivity. I we'll, think we'll that's get it printed amazing. on the t-shirt. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I I think let's chuck out toxic positivity and toxic negativity and let's talk about greater compassion. Mm. So, you know, mm. it's being self-compassion and compassion to others. So, I do love that toxic positivity makes me want to throw it out but it's <laughs> toxic positivity. I think we've found the subject of I your next research you paper. It. I know exactly. <laughs> I I I'm a very positive person you probably hear this but I compassion first mm. being a human understanding that we're human that comes first. How do you think that someone recognises the cycle and complexities behind them self-medicating? If you're stuck yeah. in the cycle, maybe you yeah. don't know it. It's incredibly powerful. And again, this is a strategy that I use in everyday life as well. And that's just a bit of a theme of what we've been talking about. To write things down, to observe patterns, to understand when things are happening. The relationship between feeling stressed, the relationship between the triggers 
for you, the relationship between are you using substances, are you using alcohol, are you using drugs to cope, and then what does that mean? Cope with what? And when is that most intense? And then when are you most vulnerable? So it's both my research, but also our approach is to try and break it down into bite-sized chunks, mm. break it down into parts that you can actually address rather than seeing it as a global, well, I drink to cope and that's all there is to it. If someone is stuck in that cycle as well, there might be a lot of physiological stuff going on too. Right, well, I'm sure there is. Is there like a Cliff Notes version you can give us of kind of the effects of alcohol and drugs on the brain that maybe people don't realise? I think that particularly with alcohol, people are very used to the idea of drinking and that first sense of feeling euphoric and more relaxed and more engaged, feeling more social. They're quite used to that and quite used to the associating with drinking and in a sense we do have that as a message in our advertising sport particularly a lot of advertising of alcohol connected to sport and sport is such a positive activity for people to be involved with fun enjoyment so I think people have really got that connection I think what they don't have is that in the end you know alcohol is a depressant so the longer term effects are that you do feel a sense of hopelessness and a sense and alcohol can exacerbate that so I I feel we very much connect alcohol with that euphoric effect and we don't connect it with the fact that longer term it is actually a depressant. So understanding that and when it flips from being joyful through to not Mm. is really, really important. And similarly, methamphetamines, similarly with stimulant drugs, you get those initial rushes, but we then prime our brain to be expecting the dopamine and the neurotransmitters, which gives those pleasurable effects. And when you take the drug away, your brain and the neurotransmitters, you've depleted them in your brain and you're really wanting those. And that's what drives you to really then crave and need that drug to feel normal. I feel like um, particularly in the context of the current COVID wave in Sydney and the pandemic in general, there's probably a greater risk for people to reach for some of these things to make themselves feel better or to self-soothe. What are the, some of the things in your toolkit that actually make you not do that? I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty simple question to ask someone how they're not a drug addict hey? but um, how do you stay strong what's in your what's a good, good mental health toolkit I think the fact that you brought mental health into that too is really important you know what's in the mental health toolkit is a really good way of thinking about what are the things that I do to not then find myself at the end of the day the only thing I feel like I can do to cope is to have a drink Mm. okay so there's about four things one of them we sort of already touched on and while it's super super important at the moment to keep up with what's going on in the news it's also important to cut yourself a bit of a break and have a bit of a break from that so it might be that you don't have to get up and the first thing you do is look at the news. Now in the areas that are locked down at the moment you don't get the first set of news about the latest changes until 11 o'clock so what about making sure at least you don't look at your social media feed as Mm. the very very first thing go brush your teeth and go have your breakfast before you actually look at your social media can i pat my cats too is that all right oh my golly you know the funniest (laughs) thing as you just said that my cattle dog just bumped in here and jumped on my lap and i was about to say go pet your cat (laughs) <laughs> I, tr- I try to look in. at my phone in the morning, and then um, Cat Stevens knocks it out of my <laughs> knocks it out of my <laughs> hand. <laughs> it's really scary the number of people who look at their phone mm. before they do anything else in the morning. How many people look at their phone before they have breakfast? Mm. So challenge yourself. Actually, have breakfast, then look at your phone. So that's one. The other one is physical exercise is so so important for our mental health. So even in lockdown, we're still able to have a walk. So it's making sure that you have those if you're feeling overwhelmed having a walk is really really important for dealing with those feelings those anxiety and those depression feelings we are in an incredible time of anxiety with COVID we're worried about our loved ones we're worried about what life will be like in the future it can have a really strong sense of not feeling in control so for me it's looking at the things that I can control so what's something in a day that I can control can I choose that today I'm going to cook something 
Can I choose that today I will go for two walks? Can I choose that today I will start a new activity or I will ring a friend? What's something that you can control? Mm. And then take pleasure in the fact that you chose to do that today, even though there's a lot of other things you can't control in our lives at the moment. And that's the virus in particular. I think I've given you my four big ones. Probably my last one is work out how to connect and that is becoming increasingly more difficult. Originally in 2020, Zoom, you know, it was a bit interesting and there were all sorts of different ways you couldn't connect over Zoom and we were having trivia parties and we were even just talking to each other over mm. Zoom. But now we've got a lot of fatigue. You've got to think of different ways to connect over Zoom. So one of the ones we've been doing at work is the first five minutes of a Zoom, everyone puts their microphone on and people are off mute and we just let the chat flow for five minutes in a chaotic way and it makes it feel like we're having a normal as possible interaction over zoom Mm. so lots Mm. of little tiny strategies about how to connect in a world where we're physically distancing so socially connect in a world where we're physically distancing so they're the sort of four ones i've been trying to practice every day (laughs) but it's not easy no (laughs) we had this idea this morning in our um our morning meeting that we should try and start every day with like a pump up song because Obama used um, oh, I love that. Lose Yourself and then we were like we're going to listen to our pump up song and then we're going to go back and we're going to say three good things that happened yesterday and then three good things that we're looking forward to today so I love it that's, that's yeah, our, that's our new it. strategy going forward that is brilliant and we've just got to keep thinking up new strategies don't we so because they're not yeah, boring keep having fun because, somehow somehow having fun because we are social animals and the physical distancing is really creating havoc with that at Mm. the moment. You've described yourself a few times in the last couple of interviews as a positive person. Is that a muscle you've had to build? Do you think you're naturally positive or is something you work on every day? You know, I like that idea of a muscle, but I don't think about it that way. I think about it more as a spring. I've got Mm. an inner spring and sometimes it does get unwound and I have to find out ways to wind it up again. And it can fatigue. (laughs) like a muscle does but I I suppose you could think about it as a muscle it's just that for me it's more an inner spring and that's because I know sometimes I just need to wind it up I have to work on it every day and I do probably find it easier than I know some of my friends and colleagues to be positive even in the face of you know failing research or a face of negativity but I do have to work on it every day but I'm always always I wake up every day so grateful that I'm able to wind that spring up again. Where else are you getting your dopamine hits during the day? (laughs) Well, a big one for me is interacting with people. Another one, I just get such a kick out of working particularly with and doing research and walking in partnership with people who've been thrown. You know, they really have been thrown a really tough roll of the dice. There's multiple, multiple reasons why they find themselves struggling with mental health or with drug and alcohol and I just get such an amazing kick out of working with people to see their lives turn around and it doesn't happen all the time but when it does happen it is just incredible so that really gives me a boost every single day because as tough as it is for me it's a lot tougher and they are just incredibly inspiring. Why did this become your purpose? Why do you think that you connected with helping people like this? I always had a real interest in helping people who'd been challenged by health problems. I saw grandparents with polio. I saw grandparents who lost legs and accidents and couldn't work. And so that sort of helping was always there for me. But I really didn't know how to channel it. And I was just super lucky one day to go to a medical specialist when I was in my teenage years. And I said to them, if you had your time over again, what would you do? I don't know why I asked them that question, but I did. And they said, 
I would do psychology. He said to me, if I had my time over again, I would do psychology. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. So I went off to university and I studied psychology and I was just, I loved the science of it and I loved the solving problems and I loved, you know, working with people. And I got my first job working in the inner city area in Sydney. So a very deprived area, you know, a lot of homelessness, a lot of people with mental health and drug and alcohol problems and I was just got my university degree it was super interesting super cool I thought I was going to solve the problems of the world and I was working a lot with individuals who were in the hostels for the homeless and there was a young man there called Jonathan and he was only a couple of years older than me and he was incredibly well loved incredibly well loved particularly by his mum his mum and I know this because his mum was Anne Deverson who's a human rights journalist in Australia and she wrote a book about Jonathan called Tell Me I'm Here and Jonathan had both schizophrenia and drug and alcohol use and probably only the week after I started work or ready to change the world Mm. Jonathan who was only a couple of years older than me died of an overdose in the hostels for the homeless and that just never left me that Mm. the tragedy and he was absolutely so well loved so from that day I was you know he didn't have the opportunities and his family didn't have the opportunities to have him in their lives and so I was really passionate about doing all I could to make sure that didn't happen to other people yeah Mm. You kind of never know how far that circle of influence goes, do you? Like the interactions that you have with people and how much they impact on you. Yeah, we're social beings, aren't we? We're social beings and they can really impact, really, really impact on you. But I also think that for me, I wanted to solve the world's problems, Mm. but it also brought it really um, home to me that these are individuals and every single one of them counts. Do you still want to solve the world's problems? Of course I do. (laughs) What gets me out of bed every day? (laughs) <laughs> which uh, which one are we going to tackle first then? I suppose I suppose the one you've spent your uh, you know last several years looking into. Yeah, that relationship between mental health, alcohol and drugs. Mm. Yeah, that's a big one for me. More recently, I've been quite focused on prevention. So I've been focused on what could we do? How can we work with 12 and 13 year olds to give them the skills? so that they can make the decisions and have an empowered relationship with any mental health problems they may experience and also when they become exposed for the first time to alcohol and to drugs, Mm -hmm. how can we give them the skills to make the positive choices in their lives? I am so happy to play a small part in amplifying that message and I'm sure Andy is as well because we we want to help you change the world. (laughs) Well, having the chance to talk to both of you is just really a fantastic way to to both inspire like it's so inspiring talking to both of you with your passion and I think that amplifying is really important yeah that's so lovely I'm gonna make sure I cuddle my cattle dog Mm -hmm. and go for lots of walks (laughs) (laughs) so now we've looked at reframing thought and we've explored the situation of when it's more complex like an addiction but what if what you're facing is a chronic illness or a disability Next time on Reframe of Mind, we speak to Tisha Rose, multiple sclerosis mindset coach who has been living with MS since she was in her 20s. I'm no longer defined by MS. It's not on my mind all the time. You know, I read a story about someone with MS and I'm like, oh, that's awful. And I'm thinking, no, I've got that disease. That's me. <laughs> and then so it's not there. You know, I'm not thinking about it all the time. If you're concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional advice and support. You can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or at beyondblue.org.au. Or you can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org.au. More resources can be found on our website. Today's interview with Professor Marie Thiessen AC is the full-length interview. For more full-length interviews with guests from the series and more special extras, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reframe of mine. For more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.